Collector Diary Mini Edition. Maybe a review on here as well. We'll see. Maybe not. That's the wonderful thing about this channel. It's all so informal. This isn't a TV show. YouTube is a democratic experimental forum. It's funny, isn't it? Because everybody wants to say they're innovating and what have you. And I do like a certain classicism of form, but you know, a lot of YouTube stuff is like a TV show. It's very professional, which is nice. And people like that. They like the format. But I like to mess with that a bit and make it a little bit more off the cuff, as you know. So, so who knows what this will turn into be, but you'll watch it anyway if you're a thinking, independent minded person who likes a bit of quality. So I'm back from my holiday at Hay on Wye, and you'll have seen the videos for that. I'm trying to get back into filming thematic and subject focused videos, more format based videos. But at the moment, I'm waiting for certain things to come in the post. And I've got a big project in the hideout at the moment to make it tidy, to make it easier to film. And I'm hoping that the bits of kit I need will come today and then I get that work done. And towards the end of the week, do a lot more filming because this is what happens when I'm on holiday. I'm making videos for you guys. I'm never on holiday, even when I'm away. But I am taking it a bit easier this time and chilling out and listening to lots of music. I had a bit of musical time in Hay, as you would have heard. But we'll have a look at what I've got recently in terms of SF acquisitions. And just there, you can see I have an advanced paperback copy of Alien Clay by Adrian Tchaikovsky, probably the country's favourite world builder these days. And I might be doing an event with Adrian later this year. We'll see. It's not confirmed yet. And it might be for this book and it might be for another one he's got coming a bit later in the year. Now, this isn't out until March. Now, please note, when it comes out, it'll be a hardcover. OK, not a paperback. So I got in touch with um, with the lovely people at Tor, Pan Books, I used to work for, and asked for an advanced copy and said, you know, if you send me a copy, I'll show it on my channel. That's what people do, you know, and I get free stuff from work anyway. And incidentally, if you're a self-publishing author, please don't email me and ask me to review your book because I won't. It's that simple. I have very definite um, rules on that. I don't review self-published books, end of. If you want to know why, you can write to me and I'll tell you why. You get a stock response, but generally I will not even respond. So, yeah, Alien Clay. So this is, um, looks like it's a bit like Bios to me. It's about a planet where everything is really sort of harsh and unforgiving and dangerous to um, human colonists. But I see, so that's out in March, 28th of March, round of March, and it'll be a hardcover. Um, the paperback will not come until... It'll be late in the year, early next year is more likely. And it's a singleton or standalone as the lightweights call it. And yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I haven't read anything by Adrian for a while because I do think he's produced rather a lot. But it's rather, rather beautiful. I think you'll agree. So I might delve back into genre SF with that. And then on the other side, this is something I picked up. I've not even looked at this yet. And um, this is the sort of antithesis, really. And um, this is Italian science fiction and the Environmental Humanities, published by University of Liverpool Press. And of course, Liverpool, is Liverpool where the Science Fiction Foundation is these days? It used to be in um, North London Poly, that was about in the 70s and 80s. But yeah, it's been Liverpool for a while, I think. And um, you know, they do these sort of SF course there. And it's all about Italian science fiction and the environmental humanities, as it says. There's lots of essays um, going back through the history of um, Italian SF. And uh, this is the sort of thing I really like to read. Um, because even if I can't get these books, it gives me some background. And as you know, I'm an Italophile. I'm a really big fan of everything Italian. So, yeah, um, this is new. It's £65. But of course, I get a discount and I had some money on my discount card because my very wonderful company, they give you money at Christmas time to spend on books, which is lovely. So there you go. So that's that. So that's the sort of thing I really like. And I have been thinking about making a video called why you won't learn anything about science fiction from watching YouTube. And it's not strictly true, but I am generally of that opinion. You'll pick up little bits and pieces and you'll pick up opinion. Um, but the way you really learn about science fiction is by reading, by both reading it and reading about it. And at some point you have to do deep dives like this and try and, you know, see, expand things. So I've got that there. So I'm looking forward to that. So I'm going to pop that back on the podium there, as it were. And another thing now, this is this is a, this is not a book. This is a um, CD and Blu-ray, which I'll show you again in a moment. Um, my friend Mark bought me this. He bought me this as a present 
Um, he didn't buy her in Hay on Wye, but he gave it to me there. And this is um, Last and First Men by Johan Johansson and Ia Elisiel Glotman on Deutsche Gramophon. And as you can see, this is a very handsome Digipack CD. I don't like Digipacks generally for a dual case, but this is the only edition. And this is both a Blu-ray of the film of Last and First Men, and that's Last and First Men, the Stapledon novel, um, and also the soundtrack on CD. Now I have seen the film, this came out two or three years ago, and I've not heard the music independently. Deutsche Grandfather, of course, is the world's premier classical music label. So I'll just show you that there. And what it is, um, if you're not familiar with Last and First Men, it's a, a novel about the sort of future of humanity over a sort of cosmic scale. And what this does, the film has lots of music in it, which is fairly stentorian and classical and stark. And it depicts these concrete structures, which are in, is it Romania? I haven't prepared, you see, this is just absolutely typical. And I forgot I need to prepare this. Let's have a look. We'll have a look in the booklet. And the imagery is very stark and industrial. And towards the end, you get um, Tilda Swinton, I think it is, um, reads from excerpts from the book, Last and First Men. So it's not really... Um, it's not a feature film as such, but as a science fiction film, it's really something special. It's very slow and stately. You could say it's boring um, or tedious, but what it actually does is washes over you. And it's a non-narrative thing. And this must make you think about the vastness of the cosmos and, and the immensity of time and the tiny periods that we hear as human beings. And um, it's really quite striking. And let me just see if I can find... Um, Let's have a look. Johansson's an Icelandic composer, and fundamentally the pictures are, are of these structures, which are called Spomenex. And Spomenex um, are in the former Yugoslavia. Now, for those of you who are younger, Yugoslavia used to be one sort of state. It's comprised of Croatia, Serbia, Bosnia, um, a few others and bits and pieces it's balkanized after the war which is a terrible thing and I'm probably doing it a disservice I've not been there I really want to go to um, to Croatia actually so it's, it's on my holiday list and um, it's sort of it's full of imagery like this so if you're a Tarkovsky fan if you like Solaris and Stalker this will really be up your street it's quite sort of tense and grim and stately and you know it really is quite something so it's not like watching you know starship troopers it's a different sort of ballpark so that's last and first men so it makes a nice compliment um to the book and for those of you who have really cosmic visions and you want to chill out and let this ambient film wash over you then there you go i'm looking forward to seeing that again so thanks to my friend mark for that somebody i've been thinking about a lot recently is eric brown the um, british sf writer who died a little while ago and he was very young he was only about 62 and eric was somebody i've read about eight or nine books by him and he's somebody i've been not scathing about but he's somebody i've sort of sort of downrated really and he was pretty much the first of the gene rats the young british sf writers who came out of interzone in the sort of mid to late 80s alongside people like um stephen baxter paul mccauley and this is helix by Eric Brown and nice little A format paper of Solaris and I read this when it came out which is about 2004 let me just have a look let's just check and let's see 2007 and this is a great little world building book nice and chunky as you can see and it's sort of very imaginative and Eric's very gentle and he's very very good with human emotions love stories and things uh, but he writes really well so very engagingly and he kind of reminds me of Michael Coney, who I need to do a video about for the channel. And I think if you like a good bit of world building and you want to look at the guy who was the first to break out of that stable and to get somewhere and to get books published and things, it's Eric Brown, really. He was the sort of the guy who sort of came forward first. He never got as big as um, Reynolds or Baxter or any of those people, but he is really good. And he did all sorts of things. So I've read loads of books by him and I regard him as a really excellent entertainer. And apparently he was a really nice guy. So Helix is well worth a look at. I've just reacquired that because I got rid of it. But I saw it still in print and I thought really nice little A-format paperback. 
no, he's gone. I miss him. And this is fairly typical, isn't it? Then you often underrate people when they're alive and you don't re realise how good they are. He's a really good, solid entertainer. And a few Christmases ago, I read his Telemas Quartet, PS Publishing, um, which are very short novellas. And I read them in about a week. There's four of them. Altogether, it would have been about like 400, 500 pages and set in a universe where um, mankind has got teleportation um, devices and there is a coda which I haven't read and I sold them on I wish I kept them they're nice books so if you ever see the Telemans Quartet they've never been published in paperback somebody should do an omnibus edition of them that'd be really nice so and um, watch out for those and recently I bought this from Newcon Newcon Press um, one of Britain's premier small presses after PS they probably are the thing and they're run by the SF writer Ian Waits and this is Starship Fall which is a sequel to his book Starship Summer, which was published by PS. And this comes later on. And it's about a guy called David who lives on this colony planet um, called Chalcedony. Um, Chalc Chalcedony Delta Provonis IV. Great. Eric Brown's great with those sort of things. You know, like my favourite moment in Dune, and I'm talking about the David Lynch one, is when the Harkonnen world comes up and it says Gady Prime. I mean, Gady Prime that has more poetry in it than the rest of Dune put together. And Adam Roberts did a great TED talk about how science fiction is like poetry. And he was talking about the imagery and things. He didn't quite articulate it as clearly as I felt he could have. And, you know, Adam's a sophisticated guy. And I think sometimes he forgets that not all of us are as sophisticated as he is. And he talks about the poetry of science fiction. And yeah, it doesn't look great. It's going to be by Tony Ballantyne with Twisted Metal, which is a really good little robot novel. And yeah, new con really nice. And this is the limited edition hardcover, 1899, still in print. And I got this because it's signed by Eric. And you know, it's a great, it's a great shame he's gone. Uh, number 151 of 200. And there's a, there's a paperback edition as well, I think, which is probably about 12 quid. Really, really nice. Lyrical, gentle stuff. Looking again at um, new con, I also bought this book which I've wanted to get for a while. And this is somebody I know, and we've met a few times. There's an interview with him on the channel. I did an event with him. I saw him recently in London at the Reports from the Deep End signing, which hardly any of you have watched. The 900 odd Ballard fan show have watched it. And that's Chris Beckett. And this is Marcher, and Marcher in the new con edition. And this is the definitive edition of the text. There have been three different variants. And I've not read this one. And when I interviewed Chris on the channel about a year ago, he told me this was the definitive text, this preferred text, and it's an expanded one. And Marcher is set in Bristol, which is only 10 or 15 miles from me. I spend a lot of time in Bristol, great city. I've been visiting there since the late 70s when I used to go to Forever People, the science fiction bookshop. And March is a fantastic book. I hope you agree with that cover. is great, isn't it? It's about a guy who works in Bristol and he's like a border agent for people who are sort of illegal migrants who are coming in to Bristol and the rest of the UK from another universe, from an alternate universe. It's also got a strange sort of folk horror -y, mystical thing and druggy thing in it as well. And I thoroughly enjoyed it when I read it. It's a really entertaining book. It's one of Chris's earlier novels, um, but I really recommend it. It's the one that comes after Holy Machine, which is his first novel, which is a punch in the guts. And um, this is really great stuff. And the characterization's good and say set in Bristol, so I could really relate to it. And um, marvelous, marvelous stuff. And this is number 82 of 100 copies. And yeah, there's a paperback of this as well. So I'm really pumped to get that because I really want to read this. And Chris hasn't been well recently. Chris, I hope you're watching this. I hope you're okay. And it was good to see you um, before Christmas. Um, really great guy, underrated writer. I know John at Sci-Fi Scavenger has been discovering Chris Beckett recently and I've been reading for years. Fantastic stuff. So really, really, really good. Give it a try. Chris used to be a social worker, so he knows all about the sort of things that the character in this does. He's kind of a social worker as well. There's this sink estate where these people are coming through. Really, really good. Love it. Brilliant. Excellent. I'm very pleased with that. So nice to support Newcon. Newcon do a best of British SF every year. I did ask them to send me something. One of their authors got in touch with me and they were supposed to be sending me an anthology to review. I must chase that up. I know Ian Waits at Newcon hasn't been well 
recently either so hopefully he's okay and I, I must say I've never read any of Ian's stuff but um, he does a great job at Newcon lots and lots of exciting stuff novels novellas anthologies collections a lot and then sticking with small press I've got a couple more things here I bought a book from PS2 and PS2 is um, let's see PS2 there it is is the alternate website the alternate um, universe website if you like of um, PS Publishing and PS are Britain's premier small press they've been going now for must be coming up to 30 years run by a guy called Pete Crowther and they've done lots of really really beautiful books over the years and on PS2 what they do is they sell off damaged copies things with dings or dinks as they call them and they have the odd sale and clearance and what have you they do hardcovers trade paperbacks science fiction fantasy horror some general fiction absolutely great stuff really good i've got loads of their books and i wish i'd bought them over the years but you've got to keep an eye on ps2 because they have absolute bargains and funnily enough this is also an eric brown and this was only three pounds okay so you wait till you see it now it's um 25 pound is the is the sort of retail recommended price and this is the disciples of apollo by eric brown 25 pounds down to three quid the postage was more the postage was like 3.99 so you're talking seven pounds altogether but seven pounds for a hardcover nice and thick and chunky and this is the best short stories of eric brown so i decided to get that because i want to celebrate eric's life and um what they also because they do these things there'll be a limited edition a trade edition so this is kind of like a tradey one and very very nice indeed i think you'd agree three quid a while ago they were selling terry dowling's rhinoceros trilogy which is probably the most famous australian sf series hard covers um and they're in a slip case and they were doing it for like 50 quid and normally it's 150 they've gone now and people are trying to sell them online for like 200 or more really beautiful they do trade paperbacks if you're interested um maybe i can read it one time i know my friend tim um had a go at them recently and just to show you some more on this underneath the jacket you've got lovely laminated boards with the picture on look at that isn't that nice wrap around artwork same as the jacket absolutely beautiful gorgeous and to finish up this segment or maybe this video we'll see is also another Eric Brown from PS which is the Ice Garden and other stories and 18 pounds hardcover and I got this from their main website PS Publishing so course if you put PS into the internet you'll get PlayStation and again lovely laminated boards beautiful now they did the two of these in a slip case and I am a sucker for slip case but it's something like 85 quid i think and um i didn't want to pay that much just for a slipcase and of course they're signed and what have you and these two are trade editions so so i got the other one for 6.99 and this of course you get that 89 so this is about 25 quid with the postage so let's see 25 so it was like 30 quid altogether you know for the two um, really really nice so I've got a load of Eric short stories there to go through and what I may do I know some of you make slip cases you just send them the um, measurements I must I can't remember if I still got their contact details and they'll make a slip case up for you and I've only done it once or twice if I could afford it I guess slip cases made from most of my books and they'd be nice as a set but I didn't want to shell out for a massive expensive things so other things um, signed by Eric so that's a little haul for you there maybe there'll be a bit more to this reviews segment more damp and dry reviews you'll notice the damp thing is coming up and <laughs> it's it's not going away it actually it is but it's it's still seeming quite relevant based on what i've been reading and looking at over the last few months and thinking about with contemporary sf and I'm going to start with a brief review of a pure genre SF book. This is The Maker of Universes by Philip Jose Farmer in the corrected text from Fantasia Press. And behind me you see its sequel, The Gates of Creation. And I'm going to show you these again. I'm going to show you the whole series in another video which is coming up, which is looking at the difference between a nice edition of a series which is issued for the mass market for people who aspire to be collectors then looking at the work of a particular 
online long-term publisher who seem to try and get across the idea that they are for serious collectors. And then I'm going to show you some of the real thing, the real small press stuff, to show you what the real standard is and the sort of difference in the, in the two things, really. And Fantasia Press would fall into that final category. But as I say, as you see, very beautiful, very Burrisian. And that, of course, is Edgar Rice rather than William S. Now, Farmer, of course, is somebody I, I, I've read loads of books of. And you don't see a lot about him on Booktube. I did a video probably about eight months ago, maybe longer, called Metafictional Pop Genius. And I talked about his parody and pastiche work in the Wold Newton universe, which I think are his best things. World of Tears is a five volume series. And then there were two adjuncts later on, Redox Rage, which I've read. And there's another one, which I didn't read. But you really sort of stick to the first five. And if you're a rock and roll fan, if you buy the 1980 album by Hawkwind called Levitation, which was the first digitally recorded rock and roll album, there's an instrumental on there called World of Tears, which is fantastic, very kinetic and bright and full of energy. It's got Ginger Baker from Cream and a wonderful sort of Tim Blake synth player from Gong. And it really rattles along. If you like things like Oslo Tentacles, it sort of boots that into touch. It really does. But anyway, Maker of Universes. And these are nice books. And they have introductions by Farmer, in which he talks about the inspirations. He talks about how the titles were originally meant to be and how Donald A. Warheim changed them. They were written mostly in the, in the 60s. And the fifth one, Lava Light World, didn't come out to about 1980. And I've got paperbacks as well, and I'll show you those as well when we do a comparison. But this is a book where the basic idea of this, he had the ideas for this as pocket universes um, back in the late 30s when he was a kid. And he imagined this world which was like the Tower of Babel, different levels on top of each other, like a cylindrical thing rather than a globe. And he had the idea for this and he didn't go into writing it till the 60s, by which time I think other people probably had started doing pocket universe things. And this really is a straight ahead adventure tale. And it begins with the narrative, the first person narrative of a guy called Robert Wolf. And he's and he's sort of in his mid sixties, he's looking at a house with his wife who is rather sort of dumpy and getting him down and what have you. And he feels rather constrained by her. And he's looking around this house and he goes downstairs and he finds this cupboard with a horn in it, like a trumpet. And he blows this horn and it opens a portal into this other universe to the world of tears. And he steps into it and that's how it starts. And he discovers this strange world and the world, the tear that he first goes on, because there are several tears, he discovers gorillas which are zebra striped and talking eagles and all sorts of things like that and it's sort of very sort of fleet and he also mentions at the beginning that he's lost his memory that he can't remember he's a child and he's an orphan and, you think, mm. and of course Roger Zelazny does that at the beginning of Nine Princes and Amber a bit later on which is a great book and I enjoyed it but at the same time, it was a bit too straight ahead for me. And it's quite muscular and sleek and it rattles along. But by the end of it, um, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it a lot. It was reminding me of why I stepped away from Farmer and why I never became a completist because he did do a lot of routine adventure work. Very spectacular compared to most things like that with full of sinew and verve. And as I say, the pace is really good but he was somebody capable of a lot more. And this, of course, is a problem for all sorts of writers and has been from the dawn of commercial time where they have to keep writing to make money because not everybody has huge successes. And these very, very much feel that way. Now, I started to read the second volume, Gate of Creation, and I'll just pop that down let you have a closer look at it. Uh I enjoyed this and the plan was to, re to read sort of read through all five and I started reading this and there's been certain revelations by the end of the first volume and I started to feel weary and straight away this felt like even more second rate even by his standards and it was full of strange monsters and beings and what have you and it just felt childish and it summed up the real problem of a lot of genre SF and SF's always had this problem since it came out of the magazines is that there isn't really a lot of subtext in World of Tears. There is some, there's a lot of things about power and religion and transformation, 
But at the same time, there are better books to read out there on this subject. Anyway, have a look at the cover. Isn't that bonkers? And, you know, there's a certain gonzoid energy, you know, the idiot gleeful energy that we go to for SF, which is rather like punk rock. I always think the science fiction is the, the punk rock of um, of literature. You know, if, if, if literature were music, SF would be punk rock. Sometimes it would be prog. It would be rock music anyway. So I really put this down after about 20 pages, as I thought. It's just not going to satisfy me intellectually or in a literary sense at all. So I've put it down. I will probably go back to it. But it did remind me of why with Farmer, you have to pick very carefully. Now, I'm not having a go at him particularly. There's a lot of writing like this. And recently, in the context of Farmer, I mentioned Piers Anthony and um, Jack L. Chalker. You know, these these are writers who have ideas and the ideas are good, but the execution sometimes is very hasty and hurried and it doesn't sort of raise itself up. And of course, I did that monumental review recently of Starve the Unborn by Werfel, which loads of people watch, which Matt the Book Pill gave me, which is a book of more serious intent. But at the same time, it was too big and, and didn't could have done with the fleetness of these things so it's getting that balance between the two and this is the problem the sf has genre sf just often appears absurd to general readers because they're used to something a bit more realistic and it's not essentially the realism it's it's if the ideas aren't metaphoric if the metaphors aren't strong and made clear it's just escapism and for this reader escapism is not enough so it really sort of got me down and I thought I stop I want to stop this and I recently started another book which I will review on the channel when I finish it I am going to finish it but I had the similar feeling and that was Cirque by Terry Carr now Terry Carr of course is the editor of the eight specials he was a well-known editor from the mid 60s till his untimely early death in the mid 80s and he wrote short stories and Cirque is his I think his only novel and I started to read it and it was very, very beautifully written and smooth and interesting ideas, but it just didn't do it for me. It started to feel like a children's book, but it could well be that because it was focusing on traditional genre concerns, rather like these books, that maybe, you know, that maybe it put me off. So I don't get me wrong. I like Farmer. I like a lot of his work. I've read loads of it. But it also reminded me with these books of why I stepped away from him and why I didn't read him for a long time. So pick carefully if you want to sort of me to do some recommendations. I'll stick them in charts. I'll probably do a farmer overview at some point, a bit wider. But look at the video on the World Newton Universe because that's the cream of the crop. So I really felt I needed to make a change then. And what did I do? Well, you can see that book gathering evidence behind me. But we'll come back to that because I've reviewed that on the channel. But I want to talk about that again. So what happened then? Shocking. Shock horror probe. Steve read a mainstream bestseller. Now, with bestsellers, because I've worked in the book trade for so long, if I try and read a bestseller, a book that everybody's reading, I feel like the world is looking over my shoulder. I've seen too many great books fall by the wayside, not get their day in the sun. And I tend to look down on bestsellers, I'll be honest, because I think everybody's reading this. D you know, does the mass have any discernment, either on the escapist side or the literary side? You know, are they as bad as each other? Are they as good as each other? Is it just my bias coming through? And I'm willing to admit that it may well be. But when you're close to something like books all the time and you see the hype and you're involved with that sort of thing. You know, it can be hard to be objective and sometimes you don't want to be objective. But I read a mainstream bestseller. I read this, My Year of Rest and Relaxation by Otessa Moshfeg. Now, there are probably millions of reviews of this on Booktube and it came out two or three years ago. And where I work, we sold hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Did well in hardcover. Her previous book before this was called Eileen. And that was shortlisted for the Booker Prize. And it was sort of cast as a crime novel. I've not actually read it myself. I think it does have a sort of crime element. This looked totally different to it. And lots of the guys and ladies who I read it and they said it was really good. And I like the title and I like the sort of glaring pink and the lady in the Empire Line dress looking as if she has a bit of ennui going on. And I actually bought this for the video widow. Um, who does read, she reads a lot of non-fiction, a lot of history, things like that, but she did, does read the odd novel, and I thought this might work for her. And 
I brought it home and I thought well, I'd like to give it a try as well. And I picked it up and I burned through it in about two days. I think I did three settings. And it's really, really good. It's very, very funny. You could say it's like a non-violent American psycho um, set in the year 2000 and 2001. So there's a certain clash to 2001 because we remember what happened in 2001. And we're not talking about the film. We're talking about the terrorist event in Manhattan. And you can sort of feel that looming over it. And it's about this young, thin, pretty girl who has, I say she's a girl, she's a grown woman, but she's only about 21. And I always think that in my experience and from what I've seen of people, I don't think we really reach full maturity in the postmodern world till we're in our late 20s. I think it keeps us young. I think it keeps us infantile in lots of ways. The spoon feeding of culture we all get. She's got this fairly vacuous reception type job in a pretentious art gallery and she <laughs> really doesn't like it. And she's slim, um, attractive, arguably successful. Her parents have died recently and they've left her their estate. They have a house sort of upstate and the rent comes into from that. It's rented out and she has a nice apartment. She's having a relationship with a much older man who works on Wall Street, who's, you know, not that pleasant. And she has a more overweight friend um, who wears a heart on a sleeve a bit more. And it's a familiar sort of relationship. It's a sort of like cool ice and blonde and the sort of dumpy brunette type thing. And as I say, you'll see loads of reviews of this. And basically the central character, she just decides, I don't think we ever know her name. I can't recall her name. And she's graduated from Columbia University and she's not really very satisfied with her job and things. And she decides just to self-medicate for a year and take as many downers and tranquilizers as she can and just try and sleep for a year. And she signs up with this quack psychiatrist and gives her this list of fake symptoms and she gets prescribed loads and loads of sort of sleeping pills and things um, over the phone. And she just decides to spend as much time as possible asleep. And she has this routine where when she wakes up, she goes downstairs, you know, she lives in this apartment block. There's a concierge, as you would say in, in France, a doorman, as you would say in the States. And she goes to this Egyptian bodega, buys two coffees and goes back up with her two coffees. And she just goes through this cycle. So a lot of this book is just her doing this, but it's really, really funny. And in a riffing sort of way, and her friends a bit more forthcoming as I say and it's just wonderful I just absolutely loved it and it did remind me of American Psychos to say there's no violence or anything in it really there's a certain amount of sex and there's a certain amount of um, sort of talk about New York club life but I do love modern novels set in New York and contemporary ones and my favorites include American Psycho The Bonfire of the Vanities by Tom Wolfe which is a wonderful book Bright Lights Big City by Jay McInerney and a book, a more recent book called Everyone Is Watching by Megan P. P. Bradbury. Megan P. Bradbury, I think that's it. And that's a wonderful thing. So I really enjoyed this. So this was a totally refreshing thing for me to read a bestseller a couple of years after it came out. Thoroughly enjoy it. And I would recommend it to anything. And of course, it does build to a little bit of a climax um, in the year 2001. And very, very funny. Great book. Suit anybody. Excellent work. So that made me feel a lot better. However, I do like to stick to the experimental edge. And somebody I've been reading recently, as you know, is Martin McInnes. And I did a review of this when it came out last year. It's a book everybody's been talking about. And I don't want to talk about Martin anymore after this video until he does something brand new. I've got one more book to review by him. And I think if anybody has a problem with this, I think some people have found that the ending is not to their taste. And I would say that the ending, I can see what he's doing. He's going for a priestian ending, but it might not quite come off. I think he didn't quite manage it, but otherwise really, really good. And on the channel last year, I reviewed that book, Gathering Evidence. I'm going to talk about that again in a moment because I think it's really quite important. And I've decided to go back to it. But I decided to read Martin's first book, Infinite Ground. Now, are these science fiction novels? Yes, is what I would say. First of all, to compare this to something else, it reminded me of, to a degree, Chris Beckett's Beneath the World of Sea. This predates it, I think, by about a year. 
and this was Martin's first book, came out in 2016. And when it came out, we did a little promo with it in work. I read a bit of it then, didn't really think, do I want to go there? And I put it down. It's a striking cover, as you see. I really like that. And that may remind you of the film of Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer. And interestingly, there's a Jeff Vandermeer quote somewhere on here. Let's see. Stunning. I doubt if you've read anything like it. So Jeff Vandermeer liked it. And I blow hot and cold about Vandermeer. I first read Shriek and afterward a long time ago. I've read Annihilation. I don't think he's as original as people think he is. You know, the new weird isn't that new. Clark Ashton Smith, Mervyn Peak, M. John Harrison, all a long time ago. But, you know, he does have his moments. And I'm going to reread Annihilation, actually, because I think, I think I need to give it in the pop. But, yeah, that might remind you of, of the climax of the film um, by the very wonderful Alex Garland, um, who um, directed that, of course, all through the beach. Great little writer and filmmaker. And this is about a guy called Carlos who works in an office in, um, and it seems to be South America, it's unspecified. And fundamentally, he goes for a meal with his family and he walks out to go to the loo, to the toilet, the lavatory, the can, the head, whatever you want to call it. And he doesn't come back. And then there's an inspector, presumably a police inspector again, who's not really named. He's retired, but he takes the case on and he decides to look into Carlos's disappear disappearance. And it's the first person narrative of this inspector. And the inspector is kind of diffident and he seems washed out and he starts to look into the disappearance and he can't find much going on and he investigates the company that Carlos works for and they have this very strange thing where the company has invested in buying properties in different parts of the country which would be stand-ins if there was some sort of apocalypse so that the corporate body could move into these units, these other units, and keep on things running. So if, for example, there was a tactical nuclear attack, they'd be okay in these other units. And it kind of, it's a, and it suggests the strange idea that any apocalypse or a small scale disaster would only be that. And they also do this weird thing where they employ actors who play the part of employees and they study the actual employees and they study the people who are the most effective in terms of things like time and motion and they mimic them and they make um, reassuring noises and they fundamentally are part of the company but they're just there to make everybody feel good to set the standard they leave at a certain time every day and they're kind of a normalizing influence so it's quite insidious and it's very very interesting and it goes on from there and I won't say too much more about it but the first part of the book is called Corporation which is the biggest part and then it goes on to fly into the interior where the inspector goes into the jungle and this is where it resembles the Chris Beckett book and I guess also you could say it resembles Yanagihara's book the first one, what's it called? People in the Trees, which has very, very gloomy and dark book, but again, a big bestseller. And he goes into the interior and there's all sorts of strange things happening. And is it a bit Conrad? Not really, because the diffidence and the cloudiness and the misty, damp feeling spreads out throughout the book. And I actually found it really relaxing and enjoyable to read. And you could say that it meanders and that it's directionless but that's part of it that's part of its appeal because is he ever going to find Carlos and there's a wonderful section with lots of different possibilities about what's happened to him a bullet pointed which I really enjoyed you know he is an experimental writer but it is an SF novel there's a great section where early on in the corporation part where the inspector is looking at the forensic side of things he gets his forensic scientist in and she's examining all sorts of really strange things for clues and you're thinking this possibly can't get you anywhere so it's a kind of metaphysical detective story but i really really enjoyed it and it made a bit of a splash at the time but i decided to read it because having read um this one obviously um last year when it came out i'd also previously read gathering evidence which i've mentioned before and i 
I wasn't certain about this the first time and I reviewed it probably about a year and a half ago and I decided to go back to it because I re now really think it's quite something and I mentioned it briefly in another video recently and gathering evidence is really really strange and I think it might have just gone out of print but I think it'll get reissued but try and get one if you can and it begins with this amazing sequence which I think might have in partially inspired the opening sequence of Adam Roberts's The This and it begins with this great bit which is about 30 pages long about this new piece of software which um, is invented and called The Nest and fundamentally this piece of software is something you can have on your phone and it tracks your movements and it creates like a visual representation of them. It also monitors your health and your emotional well-being and it creates these shapes. And initially they're just on the phone, but it becomes like a social media trend and people, you know, are looking at each other's nest shapes and these strange swirls of light and um, which represent the person's well-being and their progress through life. And eventually they even get projected and cut, um, etched as it were, into sort of other planets and things. And it's just amazing. And, and it becomes a, a sort of whole social phenomenon. I'm not giving the game away here because that's only a tiny part of this book. The nest then isn't really mentioned again at all in the rest of the narrative. And the rest of the narrative is about a woman called Shell. And Shell's like a research scientist. And she and a team of other women, I think there's four or five of them, and this is where again it resembles um, Vandermeer's Annihilation. I have mentioned this recently, I know, but I wanted to mention the context of all of his books. And they go into Africa to the last stronghold of the bonobo chimpanzees, and they're about to become extinct. So this is near future stuff because they are endangered. And there's a sense that something is hunting the animals and the female scientists down. And they're doing this research project on the country they go into. They are not allowed to report back what they find. It's got to be kept within the country and peer reviewed. And at the same time, her Shell's boyfriend, John, is living at home and he is partially amnesiac. He has this spell of amnesia and there is a, something damp growing in the house again. And we saw this with Lamb by Matt Hill. And this is strange black fungus which is swelling um, around the house and it begins with a sort of poignant thing where they go to the airport together and she flies off to Africa and when I first read it I wasn't certain I read it in my lunch breaks at work and I don't think I focused on it enough I should have just brought it on and burned through it but it kept coming back into my mind and sometimes you read books they make a big impression straight away but others you think mm, and then they just swell and grow and I've really found this with gathering evidence so I'm going to go back to it and read it again. And it's very, very odd indeed, I have to say. He really does push the envelope in this. By comparison, this is not really avant-garde, except in parts. This really is, and more so than Infinite Ground. So if you've read Infinite Ground or In Ascension, this is less famous, I think. But it really is one of the most stunning experimental novels I've read for years. Possibly the best UK one since I read Tom McCarthy's Remainder. And I'm going to talk about Tom McCarthy soon again on the channel. Remainder is one of the best SF novels of this century. And it's really, really strange. So there's this whole thing about damp throughout these books. The McInnes oeuvre reminds me of Chris Beckett. It reminds me of Jeff Vandermeer. It reminds me of M.T. Hill, Matt Hill. And Matt Hill's book, The Breach, which is about urban exploration and this strange piece of video of this nest is there. So there's these links between all these books. And it's been fascinating looking at this again. And I'm going to reread it. But I would say if you really want to challenge yourself, if you like the spiky, edgy stuff, try and get a copy of Gathering Evidence because it will really put a hook in you. And, you know, you will come out of it. And it's there are no easy answers. And I'm beginning to think that the opening sequence about this piece of software called The Nest, which is the most science fictional sequence on the surface, is probably referred to more subtly in here than I initially thought, and that that's probably the key to it all. So, having read the book once, reread the opening sequence, I can look at it again, and I know I'm in for an interesting ride. So, give that a go. What else do we have? I think that's it for this segment. 
I've talked about my frustration with traditional genre fiction and the farmer mold. There will be more things coming up which are going to be on the edge. And it's an interesting thing. I watch other YouTube channels and obviously not everybody has read as much as me or as old as me. Um, and there are some people doing very disciplined things. I mean, Richard at um, Vintage SF, who's a lovely guy, has been very disciplined in reading through all the Ace specials. And as a result, he's reading some fantastic books. And it's also that thing where he's reading SF in that time, the 60s and early 70s, where the new wave is really coming through and stuff's really sort of pushing forward and challenging him. And he's being challenged and he's enjoying some things, not so much others. And it's really interesting to follow him on that, on that journey. Um, with myself, my journey now is a bit more oblique and stranger. And there's going to be a lot more mainstream fiction, which will interweave with the SF. But the SF isn't going away, so don't worry about that. It's going to stay here. So try and get hold of a copy of Gathering Evidence. And for a little bit of aridity and irony amongst the damp, do read this. It's a great book. If you want to read a bestseller and the sort of bestseller that you would normally read, if you're not a female reader or you don't normally read books by women or about women, you really should because it's entirely relatable and very witty and not cruel at all either, even though there's some tough stuff in it. I found it very sympathetic. I loved it. So this is Outlaw Bookseller with a mini book haul and some reviews signing out for now. Bye.